Hello, and thank you for having me. We can hear you over the, over the traffic. Uh, I am a, a structural engineer. Um, I work with architects. I design buildings. Uh, we're always there behind the scenes uh, preventing building design. Um, and we have our ways of influencing what happens on site, and we have our ways which we like to influence what happens and it never actually happens. But, um, Almost a, a large company like Arab, we deal with big buildings and big structures, so it may be a little different to some of the, the architects who's been speak here today. I, I, I guess there's a broad range, but um, what I'm going to talk about is, is kind of um, the trials and troubles of being a structural engineer and trying to work with some of today's iconic architects and uh, some uh, the architects of today and, and what they really aspire to do in uh, building design. That's a, when it comes down to um, building an icon and when it comes to uh, sustainable design and what that means for the engineers. So you kind of keep nodding over here and keep running the slides. Um, people always ask me, what do you actually do as a structural engineer? I thought an architect designs buildings. Well, they do uh, in a kind of, in a high level way. The architect has to be the interpreter between the building as a machine and the people who have to use it. In, in everyday society. So typically what happens is, uh, this is a competition image from Ersong, the Sydney Opera House, and, it, and he won the competition with a sketch like this with really no way to build it. There's a very long story of how um, Rivera and several, a lot of other engineers um, got very involved with it and actually managed to create pretty much spot on what he had drawn, even though everybody said it was very difficult to do. Um, in, a, in today's world, uh, this is kind of the problem we get. This is the sketch we get from architects, and uh, it's great fun. Um, I don't mean it to look like an egg or blob. It's kind of metaphoric. It's just it means some sort of form which has some architectural ideal which, as an engineer, I've never hoped to understand. Um, and they have a really real intention for it, and all they need is something to help them through it. How do we actually form this thing? How do we build it? Um, Generally, the, the blob has been drawn in Maya, and uh, things are changing now, but uh, this is sort of one aspect of what I do at an early stage of a project. So, we keep going. so uh, we do all our sketching out of it in 3D, we, we chop it up, we slice it, we, um, we do all of that engineering stuff that nobody really knows what's going on in terms of uh, how does the, the scheme work? How does, it, how does it stand up against gravity loads? How does it stand up against all sorts of other things we can throw at it? Essentially, we, we do it all in 3D. We chop it and slice it, and we give it some legs and some sort of a bones of a structure. And then we move on. We, we can analyze it, put some colors into it, and show the architect this is good, this is bad, this is the way we think it should go. Don't even bother trying this. Uh, it could be fun if you did this. And then we try and take it back to the architect before they develop their scheme, and generally the scheme is then developed within a matter of hours into something completely different, and we have to go around in a circle. So um, there's, a, there's a big drive, though, to change this, both on the architectural fronts and the, from the engineering side. Because, um, uh, yeah, it's a uh, Okay, well, it's great. This one's called a quality little class. This is what the engineers would love to do, is try and get this blob and really nail it down into some sort of rational design. And um, the architects want to do this too. Uh, eventually they have to build the block, they have to tell somebody how to build it, and that is naturally progressing towards um, how do you develop your documents, um, how do you actually draw this geometry, and you quickly find that you always need some sort of bare bones behind it which is rational, which is somewhat numeric, and um, can be defined sort of with all, within all the software programs we can use and can easily hit a piece of paper and somebody can read it and understand it. Um, essentially, this is what we're striving to achieve. We still use these things, but create spectacular structures and shapes with them. That doesn't mean the buildings have to be a square. We just run through these slides quickly. Um, this is a, a blog done in a new way. Instead of slicing it and chopping it, we step back for a bit and try and look, look at it and see uh, one of the parameters, I think you can stop there. Once you identify these parameters, um, then you're straight into a, a digital uh, rational system where you and the architect can then push and pull the building. So, what? 
So your, your 3D writer model becomes a script, and it becomes something which is um, something that can change quickly and dynamically within the parameters you set. Uh, this is often a, a problem, though, because with, with certain architects, no matter what you do, if you, whenever you attempt to entrap them within a set of parameters and say, right, this is the limits of your project, let's go this way and we can update everything quickly, uh, that's exactly what they don't want to do, and they will do everything they can to keep outside of the box. And that's, that's good to a certain extent. So some buildings will never really become rational. At the end of the day, some buildings still have to be built with a skilled worker on site, being sort of told by the architects to the next room how he actually wants it. He can achieve some amazing things, but but these days, we have uh, a lot of buildings, we have cost issues. Uh, somebody wants to build it with minimal risk, wants to make the most money out of it, and our poor old architects keeps on getting pushed back inside of boundaries and told to find new parameters. This is a building we're working on, if you keep going. It's quite typical of towers we get. Um, the tall building has been a, a huge problem ever since the early days of New York, and the early buildings here are spikes on because. And what do you do with the top of a tall building? And then we have the modern era that just slash them off somehow. These days it's like, how can we make this big thing, big phallic thing interesting? And give it a twist these days, or make it lean over or something. And keep running through. We have great software where we can, where we can really model these things and um, identify these parameters, keep it moving. And then, yeah. Is it better if I just talk like this? I think so. So, um, then there's, there's more things we've been asked to do by our architects, and that is um, not just contribute in, in terms of a responsive action, like if you want to create this shape, do it this way, but our architects will actually want to know, like, you know, how, can, how can the structure, how can all these, uh, how, how can all these, these real life factors which are out there in the environment and in inside the building and stresses and in temperatures, how can that actually influence how the architecture looks in the first place? And um, we've been asked to do some, some much more fun things. Um, this is a, a stress plot of a leaf skin building when you unfold everything and actually figure out where the forces are going. And it's great fun because then you can take it back and say, well actually, you know, this crystal shape should actually grow more in this direction because of A, B, C. It's all really good fun. It's, it's very early, early design. This, this sort of computerization isn't there all the way through to the very end, but when you're originally around the table discussing the shape, then this can be extremely useful. And they're quite fun to make, and we get to make pretty pictures and colorful ones. Okay. So um, why, why let the engineer decide, or let somebody decide using red and blue colors when we can actually program a computer to decide for us when we don't need to like we don't need to let the engineer have, have any real sort of like tactile effects in the architect we can get it straight to the computers and uh, architects find it a lot more um, digestible to know that a computer designed their bracing system than if an engineer designed it so if you run through these slides this is a an algorithm and yeah, stop that this is an, an algorithm just running on a, a plain stress model there's some loads in, there's some restraints. We, um, I designed this wall here just by hand, by eye, using intuition, and we try to think, well, you know, what if we let the computer try to do it itself? You end up with, you know, the computer, depending upon your algorithm, tries to grow trees, and you, you quickly discover that actually, my algorithm isn't, isn't really good enough. It's not what I want to create, because you're, you always tend to want to drive the design towards something, like the architect, they want to see a picture which looks like this, and they'll show you a picture. But it has to be generated by the computer. So you try to force your algorithm to do things. And it's, it's still early days, but we're developing more interesting tools. Before, um, this is used for a, a real building. Um, we run for a few slides. Um, let's go back on the chart. Same sort of algorithm. Like, we have a building, it's a bridge, we need to engage everything, we have braces everywhere. We want to expose the... If I just talk... Okay. We want to expose, expose the braces, and the architect would love to.